interesting overview. Uh, there's no convincing overview of uh, the key process of agrarian mobilization and land reform. So the next time Alan Knight writes a short introduction to the uh, Mexican Revolution, I hope that I will be part of the agrarian reform section. All right, um, Alan well, has been put on notice. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for that short introduction. Um, so I wanted to say just a few words about what I find exciting uh, about this book and about the Mexican Revolution. This is the book here. Uh, it's called uh, Matters of Justice, Pueblos, the Judiciary and Agrarian Reform in Revolutionary Mexico, um, published by the University of Nebraska Press. Um, and the first reason to be excited about this book is I think that it is a new book on the Mexican Revolution. I don't think we've had that many new books on the Mexican Revolution um, recently. And the Mexican Revolution is, of course, exciting. Um, and I'm sort of aiming these remarks a little bit at those in the audience who perhaps um, are not students of the Mexican Revolution necessarily. Um, the Mexican Revolution is very exciting. Uh, first of all, because it was the first great social revolution of the 20th century um, on, a global, on a global level, the first great social revolution. Um, this is not a completely um, consensus view. There are some uh, people who might say uh, that the social element in the revolution um, was perhaps not really that important, but here uh, at Oxford, at least, we have uh, by now a tradition of insisting that the Mexican Revolution really was a social revolution, uh, meaning that it, uh, you know, to an extent expressed the grievances um, of uh, a variety of uh, Mexican people who did not belong uh, either to traditional political or economic elites. Um, and, you know, as a social revolution, there's various ways to understand the Mexican Revolution. It can be read as a response to grievances, uh, social grievances going back all the way to the colonial period. Um, it can be read as a response to grievances associated uh, more particularly with the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz, uh, which preceded the Mexican Revolution, uh, of course, Porfirio Diaz, dictator of Mexico in the 35 years before the Mexican Revolution started, uh, and who had, um, according uh, to one interpretation, interrupted the liberal trajectory that Mexico had been on since it became independent in, uh, in 1821. And then according to, to others, it could also be read as a social revolution, a response, a social response to uh, the authoritarian or anti-popular elements within Mexico post-independence liberal trajectory. So there's very wa various ways to understand the Mexican revolution as a social revolution, uh, but at any rate, uh, it was the first large social revolution in the 20th century, and as such, I think it demands our attention. And then the second thing that really attracted me to this book in particular is that it is something that seems perhaps like a bit of a paradox or at least a surprise, namely a legal history of a social revolution. And we don't really think of social revolutions as having a legal history. We don't think of, you know, peasants or workers, you know, overthrowing a, a hated government or, you know, you know, taking up arms against tyrannous landlords or something like that. We don't think of them um, to be driven by legal concern. Uh, again, if you, if you read the subtitle of Helga's book, it's got the word the judiciary on it. So what would the peasants of Mexico, what would the people, the ordinary people of Mexico have to do with the judiciary? Why would that be an important part of the Mexican revolution? So that is, I think, uh, uh, a, a bit of a puzzle or a riddle um, that this book poses for us and uh, that hopefully we'll get into to a little bit uh, in this talk today. And then lastly, I really think this is an important book because it is actually an inquiry into the policy that is, I think, perhaps most famously associated with the Mexican Revolution. Namely, it is a book about land reform. Um, and those of you who might know almost nothing else about the Mexican Revolution will probably know that it had a very important agrarian element of it that uh, it brought to the four important agrarian demands. Um, and that Mexico actually, that, that the 
victorious revolutionary faction um, wrote the, the demand for land reform into the new 1917 Mexican constitution and that Mexico um, was, uh, you know, one of a few Latin American countries to have a really large land reform in the 20th century. And so Helga in this book is telling us about um, the origins of that land reform. So she's, she's taking us really to, you know, one of the central issues um, that we associate with the Mexican Revolution. And here's the surprising thing. She's uh, convincing us, or at least she convinced me with the book, that everybody else who had written about this very central element of the Mexican Revolution um, had been quite superficial um, and perhaps even quite misleading. This is not something that Helga herself claims, at least not in these immodest terms. This is uh, me being immodest on Helga's behalf. Uh, but I wanted to actually now start by, by, by asking you, Helga, um, what, how would you sell your book? What does, what does your book do that is different um, from what other scholars have, uh, have written about the, the land reform during the Mexican Revolution? Switch on your microphone, Helga. And the microphone. Yeah, sorry about that. There's a lot to think about here between the public in the back and the Zoomers. Okay, well, what makes my book different, first of all, is that it is a national rather than a regional social history. Um, most historical studies of Mexico of land reform are regional studies. And there are theoretical and methodological reasons why they should be regional. Uh, but one of the reasons is that you cannot travel throughout the whole country going to state archives and municipal archives. Uh, but what happened in 1992, together with the reforms to Article 27, was that the government centralized a certain type of uh, uh, agrarian archive and brought them all to Mexico City. So all of a sudden, I mean, for the first time in, in 80 years, you could sit down at the same place and uh, study Zacatecas one day and Campeche the next day. So when you go to these archives, the, the Archivo General Agrario, you know, when you look at one state, for example, you don't see much happening between 1920 and 1922. But when you look at all states, you know, after years of study, you start seeing that in 22 states in 1916, the National Agrarian Commission had already created local offices with surveyors who went out to the villages and the villagers went to complain about issues and the complaints were sent back to Mexico City. So there's a really very early um, form of state formation occurring at that time, which we didn't see with regional archives. Um, the second difference is that, as Timo said, I look at the judiciary. And I look at the judiciary because, in part, because of everything that's already happening. Well, uh, let, let me go back. I look at the judiciary because we learn from, from the books that have already written, that have already been written, that land reform in the Zapatista and the Carrancista factions, these are the two factions that had land reforms, uh, the followers of Emiliano Zapata and the followers of Venustiano Carranza uh, termed the constitutionalists. And what we learned from the books is that they were primarily uh, responses to demands for land restitution. So that was one of my first questions. What, what is land restitution? Where does it come from? You know, is it an anarchist concept that they adopted from Europe? What, what is that? And when, when you look at it carefully, it is a legal procedure that existed since colonial times and especially in the 19th century. So for me, it was crucial to understand the role of the judiciary and no study, I mean, most studies just assume agrarian reform is implemented by the executive branch of government. Um, and lastly, I think that, that it's different in terms of the way I deal with village agency. I look at the, the villagers between 1910 and 1920, not only those who rose up in arms, but especially 
those who exert legal pressure on those who hold power, whatever the faction is. Uh, they're villagers exerting legal pressure for all kinds of different land issues, land conflicts. Um, and secondly, be, when, I, when I started looking at what these villagers were demanding legal resolution to issues, only about half of them were village hacienda problems. And that has always been like the big story of the Mexican revolution, villages fought against the big haciendas. But when you look at that half, half the struggles are between villages, so inner village conflict, or, you know, a cabecera municipal, a head township against a barrio, or uh, then the story starts to be a little bit more, more complex. So I would say those three things. Thank you. This is just a bit complicated, this constant muting and unmuting, especially now that I'm only asking very short questions. Um, so my next question is, one of, what, well, one of the things that I think makes your, your book different and that is especially interesting to me as a historian of 19th century Mexico is that you actually have a, a full chapter on the 19th century, not just on the Porfirian dictatorship, uh, and also like a very empirically rich chapter, not just, you know, like a first chapter as you sometimes get of like a scholar, you know, clearing their throat or something like that, or, you know, thinking, oh, I better put in some background, but a really sort of like um, well put together, well argued, empirically rich chapter uh, on land conflicts in 19th century Mexico. So why was it important to you? Um, why is it necessary to understand land conflicts in 19th century Mexico um, in order to understand the Mexican Revolution? When the, to give you an example, the constitutionalist agrarian reform began um, in, in 1915, actually 1916. Well, the, the, the primary law is the 6th of January of 1915. In the archives, I found, for example, one Hidalgo village, Tepenene, that petitioned for land five days after the law was issued. And there were 100 signatories to that petition. So you start wondering, you know, people don't get organized in five days and issue a petition with justification of what they want and why they want it and how long they've been struggling for it. This comes from the 19th century. The same thing you see in 1916, for example, the Comisión Nacional Agraria hadn't even been established for a year. And I found a thousand petitions in, in less than a year. Um, so I went back to see where this originated from. And, and one of what, what you have to do, obviously, in the 19th century is try to figure out, which is a very complex history, of what happened during land disentailment, the privatization of uh, Pueblo communal lands. Uh, that's a story that still has to be written. However, one of the things that I started to see is that the same techniques and procedures and very similar laws were used for disentailment and for the land reforms. And this is both the Zapatista and the Constitutionalist. Uh, the formation of local committees in vill villages, hiring lawyers, uh, negotiating with state officials, searching for land titles, marking boundaries, um, conducting surveys, all that comes from the 19th century, whether they privatized their lands or not. Um, the other very important question is that the constitutionalist law and, and the historiography that developed from it had sort of this contradiction. On the one hand, villages lost their legal right to be represented in court uh, because of the liberal laws, that's the myth. And second of all, when they took their claims to court, uh, all the judges were completely corrupt and uh, biased and uh, ruled against them. Um, 
So one question is why are there so many thousands of, or hundreds at least, of lawsuits in the 19th century? So one of the reasons is they didn't always lose their legal standing. And if they did, they did so only during a short period, um, especially during the presidency of Ignacio Vallarta in the Supreme Court. And the other uh, finding is that there are a lot of, of 19th century scholars uh, finding now that courts were not all corrupt. Uh, some of course were, Morelos were famously corrupt, um, but many of them actually ruled on matters of justice. You know, This is the law and this is how they ruled and the person with the better proof won the court case. So the question was, what exactly was happening? Why were so many villages losing their court cases? And that made me look into the problem of the plaintiff's burden of proof. And that is going to be a very, very important element in both of the revolutionary land reforms. So Timo was absolutely right when he said that we are talking about a, a revolution even the Zapatista revolution that was profoundly legal. Um, and it was very important and the rule of law was very important. And when it was violated, it was violating something that was established. Thank you, Helga. Um, and that's actually a, a good segue to my next question because um, if we think of the Mexican Revolution, we often think, and especially about the early years of the Mexican Revolution, we often think of the revolution in terms of sort of like a fundamental ideological split uh, between two important revolutionary leaders. Um, the main leader of the revolution, the man you know, who had called Mexicans to revolution, Francisco Madero, on the one hand, and then the you know, agrarian leader from Morelos, Emiliano Zapata, on the other hand. And the way that we often think of this, the, the, the contrast between these men and eventually the conflict between these men is that uh, it was Madero who represented, you know, the search for legality. He wanted to return. He wanted to bring Mexico back um, to a legality that he thought had been violated by the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz, but that he also saw threatened by agrarian rebels like the Zapatistas, by the sort of like bubbling popular energies, right, that the agrarians were bringing to the table. And Zapata is then often seen by contrast as um, embodying a kind of like groundswell of popular grievance or embodying sort of like the blind fury of, you know, the mob-like masses. I'm sort of exaggerating a little bit now, but we actually find um, versions of this contrast um, in, you know, otherwise usually quite sophisticated texts, even texts that have been um, published relatively recently. Um, and so I was um, going to ask you then, Helga, um, based on your research and, uh, you know, perhaps based on what you have been finding out actually about the Zapatista sort of like a desire to make a legal revolution and to, to return also to an old legality, um, is there a sort of like new light that your research throws on this um, division and, and eventually this conflict uh, between Madero and Zapata early in the Mexican Revolution? Well, I usually leave this historia patria for the historians, but, but I have thought about the split between uh, Madero and Zapata. I mean, the, the myth is that uh, Zapata broke away from Madero because Madero did not fulfill the promises of the, the social promises of the revolution. Now, the problem with that was that Madero came into power on the 6th of November of 1911, and uh, Zapata wrote his Plan de Ayala on the 28th. So that didn't give Madero much time to prove whether he was going to have a social program or not. Um, I think the reasons are usually, you know, they're political. Um, he elected a governor, Ambrosio Figueroa, who Zapata hated. Um, every, you know, there were exchanges back and forth. 
uh, they wanted uh, the Zapatistas to disarm. And every time they disarmed, they attacked them. So it was very much a political and military thing, and maybe even personal, because in August of 1911, Madero actually was the padrino de bodas of, of Zapata when he married Josefa Espejo, one of his probably 12 wives. Uh, he only married one by law because he didn't break civil, civil law. Um, so I think what, what is interesting and the reason that I actually write on the Madero land reform, which almost nobody has written on because everybody believes there wasn't one. Well, there was one. Um, what he tried to do, and, and this ties the 19th century so nicely into the revolution. What Madero wanted to do was to use the federal public land laws intended to privatize ejidos to try and settle some of the demands for land, not demands for land, but the, the conflicts uh, over land. So for example, um, the, the Ministry of Development at the time headed by his cousin, by Madero's cousin, uh, wrote two circulars, uh, two directives, uh, which were immediately taken up in many, many states. And they asked the surveyors to come because before privatizing the lands of a village, they had to draw boundaries. And their hope was maybe they can redraw the old boundaries and that way we can recover lands from another village, from an hacienda, from whoever they believe to have lost the lands and probably did lose the lands. Um, the big problem was that once they measured the boundaries, the neighboring village or the hacienda owner could go to the courts and ask for you know, the judge to decide whose titles um, were valid. And that is where the reform got stuck. The judiciary became involved and according to the 19th century laws, they probably would have won the case because if you look at land problems in Mexico, some of them date back to colonial times, sometimes, oftentimes legal and illegal exchanges blended together. Um, oftentimes somebody stole land and then sold it legally. So by the time they take these issues to court, uh, it's very, very, very difficult to win. And the default position was that the person who had the property at the time won the court case. And this, this is very important in Mexican history because we all know that the 26th legislature, Madero's legislature, had uh, quite a few uh, radical congressmen. And we all know from the laws that they proposed either to create special tribunals to deal with these issues, or um, uh, Luis Cabrera, for example, basically said, we have to sidestep the courts. So before, I think we didn't understand why they were saying this. And now that we're seeing all the problems that happened in the 19th century and during the Madero years, uh, something had to give. Uh, just, a, just a quick follow up question then. Um, how would you describe then the main difference between um, Zapata's agrarian program as famously he formulated it in the Plan de Ayala and uh, Madero's earlier efforts at land reform? And were they actually quite similar or were, they, were there important differences between these two programs? Well, this is this is this is basically the 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 conclusions to my book. So after after studying the reforms in in quite some detail, um, I think I can say they're they're very similar because they're both responses to precisely this: how to how to settle these 
land questions outside the court. So, um, for example, if we look at the plaintiff's burden of proof, as I said, in the 19th century, uh, the plaintiff had to prove that they had titles and that the titles had uh, perfectly demarcated boundaries. So most of the plaintiffs lost. Uh, the Plan de Ayala reversed this. The Plan de Ayala basically said, those with titles to land can take the land now, arms in hand, and at the end of the revolution, we'll create a court system whereby the hacienda owners can come back and say, you know, if this is their land, show your papers and we'll, we'll figure out who's right and who's wrong. So it was very, very legalistic. Zapata didn't say, oh, we're just taking, we're taking lands left and right. It did happen, of course, and it happened in part because the hacendados fled. But legally, the plan was uh, simply to reverse the plaintiff's um, burden of proof. Now, the, the constitutionalists did something very interesting because what they did was almost to strengthen the burden of proof, because not only did they have to have titles and they had to have boundaries, but now on top of everything, they had to be able to prove that they lost the lands after 1856, which was the Lerdo law, because that the, this one of these privatization laws blamed uh, was blamed for the loss of, of communal lands. So they tightened that because what they were going to do with all the restitutions that failed was to give them a grant, a dotacion. So the dotacion, the, the famous Mexican land grant, was technically there to substitute for failed restitutions. And what they were going to do is uh, to take land from neighboring haciendas to give heads of family enough land to, to support themselves. So both the, the Zapatistas and the constitutionalists were responding to what to do with the, with the court system. And of course, in revolutionary Mexico, the courts were shut down. Well, Zapata rejected them from the start and um, uh, the constitutionalists shut them down in 1914. So there were no courts because one of the interesting stories about the 19th century is that the court had quite, the courts had a lot of autonomy and if they didn't, they fought for it. So the executive couldn't start, you know, the, the uh, um, but if those or the governors uh, couldn't start getting involved in land questions in conflicts because that was the judiciary's role. And, and a lot of the cases got lost because you know, the executive was not allowed to, to interfere. Um, very quickly, the, the other very important point is that in practice, they ran into so many problems, both the constitutionalists and the Zapatistas, that they gave up on the restitutions. And basically what they said was, we are going to deal with land according to the type of land it is. Uh, urban land, private. Urban plots, no, no question about it, that was private property. Um, agricultural lands were going to be divided very similar to the privatization uh, laws in the 19th century for heads of family and they were going to have special legal requirements so that they didn't lose the land. And this was in both camps. The, for example, family patrimony ideas uh, from the 19th century, you could not sell, you could only inherit, for example. Um, and both of them insisted that in the end, agricultural lands were going to get titled. Now, woodlands, for example, um, were going to be either municipal or um, somehow communal, and water was going to be controlled by a state agency. So every single type of land had a different uh, legal uh, status, and they were very similar. And they were very similar, not because one law 
influenced the other, or because the plan de Ayala was incorporated into Article 27, that, that doesn't exist, that didn't happen, but because they have these 19th century rules. Um, thank you, Helga. And I think, yeah, that's um, one of the really interesting stories that you that you tell in that book um, is about, I, I guess, the frustration of this dream of restitution, right, during the Mexican Revolution, because as I understand it from your book, um, there were many revolutionaries, and especially the Zapatistas at the beginning, they were very um, insistent in that the land that they wanted returned to the Pueblos were, were lands that by law, by right, should actually belong to the Pueblos. Um, and that's why it was a restitution of land. It was not, you know, it, it, it was not going to be primarily a reform where the state would just, um, you know, uh, distribute land, uh, random land to Pueblos. It was going to be a land reform where the Pueblos would be returned the land that by right belonged to them. And then in the course of the revolution, it became more and more clear that who the land by right belonged to was just too murky and too difficult to figure out. And it pitted not only towns against uh, agricultural estates, it also pitted towns against each other. Sometimes it pitted individuals against each other. Um, and so as a result of that, the revolutionaries in the end had to resort to this other mechanism in order to redistribute land, which was the mechanism of the dotacion, right? Like the, the state would basically say, okay, regardless of titles, <laughs> here is land to this town, here is land that we will give to the other town, et cetera. And so the, the, this, this sort of relationship between land distribution um, and uh, the town's own conception of justice was broken in a way? Is, do you think that's a fair way of, of putting it? I mean, I, I, what happened in, in, speaking first of, of Zapatismo, yeah. um, the, the initial plan was to give villages total autonomy. So villages, had their titles, um, Zapata and his, I mean, there, there were uh, agrarian surveyors that joined Zapata. There were a lot of technicians. There were people who had read these documents, lawyers. Uh, Zapata himself had been in Mexico City with lawyers. I mean, these Palafox, uh, Manuel Palafox was uh, Zapata's uh, minister of agriculture. These were all people who saw the documents, who believed that the pueblos had titles. And that was the initial plan. Now, first, the military establishment began, the, the military uh, chiefs began uh, distributing land. And that was a disaster. Uh, there was so much corruption and favoritism and uh, complaints back and forth. We know that because of the archives of the Cuartel General. You see them, you see the complaints, you see the answers. So the next step was for the Cuartel General, it was like a temporary government of the Zapatistas. Uh, they were like the executive, the judiciary and the legislative all, all in one. And they started taking, taking charge of the problems that existed when two pueblos, for example, um, were fighting for the same lands. And some of them had documents and others did too, but some of them were titles, others weren't, but the villagers believed they were titles. And there are great agrarian engineers who said, you know, if we start cutting up Morelos in the way that these titles are being shown, we're gonna, we're gonna swallow a whole bunch of modern villages and leave them without land. So 
what happened is what was supposed to be a very decentralized agrarian reform uh, began being centralized under Manuel Palafox and the uh, Ministry of Agriculture. And um, that is when they just said, look, we cannot deal with the legal matters. Let's just make sure that equality becomes more important than, you know, justice in, in the sense of recovering their old lands. And we'll see to the matter later on. And, and that's how these temporary land distributions uh, began. And I think I, I don't know if I answered your question, but. No, I, I think you did, thank you. Um, I, um, I think we're sort of like, we're getting a little bit to the end of the, uh, of the part where I ask you questions. So I think I just want to ask you two more questions um, before opening it up, uh, up to the audience. Um, First of all, I wanted to ask you to reflect a little bit more on you, the place of your work in the historiography of the Mexican Revolution. So land reform, I think it's sort of like used to be thought of by historians as this, you know, quite fantastic gain from Mexican peasants, right? This was a position associated with what may be called the agrarian interpretation of the Mexican Revolution, by which the Mexican Revolution actually um, distributed or, or, or gave, created land rights for a large number of peasants. And that, that, then that interpretation uh, was challenged by what is sometimes called a revisionist scholarship on the Mexican Revolution, uh, which argues that the land reform ended up doing precious little for Mexican peasants at all. Actually, uh, an important uh, contribution to that scholarship is actually called casi nada. Um, uh, and, and the reason being that the sort of the administration of the expropriated land uh, ended up in the hands of corrupt elites with ties to, you know, what, what was becoming the corrupt governing party. And so I was um, going to ask you where you would situate yourself in this conversation between an agrarian and a revisionist interpretation of revolutionary land reform in Mexico. Well, I, I somewhere in, I think it's the first chapter, I cite Alan Knight, and I think the, the very first scholar I cite is uh, um, Frank Tannenbaum, who are um, the scholars associated with the more orthodox view that it, it was a major revolution, and uh, it was a social revolution, and it changed the country politically, economically, geographically and culturally. And, and I guess largely I agree. Um, I, I don't question uh, that these are revolutionary movements. Um, I, I think a lot about, I think about different forms of being revolutionary. You know, it, it um, but, I can, I can talk about liberalism and different forms of being revolutionary later. Let me finish my thought. I, I also think that I'm somewhat revisionist. I mean, everybody wants to be slightly revisionist, right? You don't want to write more, more of the same. I think, I think basically I introduce some elements that are not part of the old debates. Um, for example, I think the rule of law matters and it matters especially when we're talking about social justice. You know, in the past, anybody who got involved in law, you know, was, was conservative and, and uh, you know, favored the Supreme Court, some battles uh, favoring landowners, et cetera. It, it, it takes a shift to be able to see, you know what, uh, the rule of law does matter. And, and one of the reasons that I think the newer generation sees it uh, not that I'm the newer generation, but uh, the ones who've been studying this after 1992, is that once the, the um, uh, Ejido sector was reformed, once the land reform sector began to be privatized, they also created a tribunal system. And the tribunal system was flooded with thousands and thousands of complaints that the executive had taken over. The executive, the the 
you know, offspring of the constitutionalists, basically took over the role of the judiciary and didn't settle the problems. Uh, problems lingered on for, for you know, decades. And these new tribunals all of a sudden brought to the fore, oh my God, you know, how many problems and, and many problems of individuals, you know, individuals who lost their land or uh, beneficiary villages who had some sort of a problem that wasn't resolved. Um, the, the other concern that I have throughout the text and is not something that I fully resolved is that whereas the Zapatista movement relied very much on the municipal governments, they relied on the, the, the remaining courts, uh, local courts. If they said they were Zapatistas, they stayed. Uh, they relied on the civil court system, on civil laws. That's why I laughed when I said that Zapata only got formally married once. Um, and, and a lot of the land issues were going to be managed, especially, for example, woodlands, uh, managed by the municipality. The constitutionalists created a completely different form of, of local form of administration parallel to the municipality. Uh, Antonio Suela is the, the first scholar to have noticed this. And this is something that has to be studied a little bit more carefully. Now, I'm not saying that necessarily the municipal system would have been uh, more democratic. Um, there's, a, there's a scholar who just wrote a book on the Morelos reforms in the 20s and 40s, uh, Salinas is his last name. He thinks that alternative, the alternative agrarian uh, administrative structure was a counterpart to the very corrupt municip municipalities. We don't know. But, but those are questions that I think should have been explored and should be explored when talking about land reform. And, and the third one, I wish I were an environmental historian because I could explain it a little bit better. The agrarian reform in Mexico was piecemeal. It uh, had to be started at the village level. They petitioned for land in different times and different places. And one of the chapters I wrote on the agrarian reform in Morelos after Zapata. Um, it's, it's the only example that we have where we can see the re how regionally complex it was. I mean, just to give you one example, water, how do you distribute water? You know, if, if one village asks for land and five years later, another village asks, asks for land, how do you distribute water? How do you distribute land that has access to water? When you have to coordinate this water with other villages who may or may not be land reform beneficiaries, but need land for, um, for local consumption or the sugar mills or the paper factories. Uh, these are all regional questions. And uh, the same thing with woodlands, a lot of destruction happened because there was no regional planning. And so that would be sort of another angle uh, that I that I look at. So I think my questions are slightly different to the old revisionist orthodox view of the, the revolution. Thank you, Helga. That's also a very good answer to say, you know what? Um, that debate, I'll leave it to the to the agrarians and revisionists. And I've actually um, tried to start a new debate and sort of like, uh, you know, make way for a new wave of scholarship uh, with this book, which which I think you have done. Um, I just have um, one more question for you, uh, and that takes us away a little bit from the book itself. But you're writing about, you know, about the Zapatistas, you're writing a little bit about Zapata, who is probably sort of the most iconic revolutionary uh, hero or, or, you know, figure in the Mexican pantheon. He's quite revered in Mexico. Um, and I imagine that discussions of Zapata can produce quite emotional responses uh, uh, in Mexico. And uh, of course, you're Mexican yourself, so, so, so you will um, know this very well. And then you have not only written about Zapata, but actually something that the audience um, don't know yet, or most in the audience don't know yet, uh, you've also curated, um, I think, one Zapata-inspired art exhibition and one photography exhibition. Is that correct? 
Um, and so I was wondering if you could um, perhaps tell us a bit, first of all, um, about uh, how your academic work on Zapata has been received in Mexico, and then perhaps also about your experience uh, organizing uh, these, these art and photography exhibitions. Yes, well, um, when I started this study, my plan was to study the constitutionalists because I said, you know, between Womack and everybody else, they've done the Zapatista uh, side. Well, when I started reading uh, the secondary literature on Zapatismo, surprise, surprise, there's nothing on land reform. Uh, part of the problem is that when Womack wrote his otherwise wonderful book, uh, he only had a number of archives, uh, basically the Hildardo Magaña archives at the UNAM. And in the 80s, uh, the Archivo General de la Nación got at least six massive collections of, of uh, Zapatista documents. So, but the, surprisingly, despite those documents, nobody had written on the agrarian reform uh, Guillermo de la Peña has a little bit, there's a little bit on Guerrero, but there's very, very little, like systematically, uh, how was land distributed? Um, since I, I became a zapatologa by accident, um, you know, people are much more interested in my work. All of us, nobody cares about Carranza, you know, you find it very boring. I find it exciting, but most people find it very boring. So you say Zapata and everybody, wow, you know. So uh, people come and listen to me. But, you know, at the same time, it's a very sensitive issue. Um, I think Womack's genius was to allow everybody who read his work to project their political desires onto Zapata. You know, for, for those reading very, very carefully, Zapata was basically a 19th century Juarista liberal uh, minus the, the anti-clericalism. Um, for Adolfo Gili, Guillermo Bonfil, uh, Miguel Leon Portilla, and the Neo Zapatistas in Chiapas, he was a pre-capitalist and he believed in communal land. Um, for people who believe that the Plan de Ayala was signed land and liberty, they see all kinds of anarchist and socialist uh, influences. Uh, Marxism played no role in the, in the Mexican Revolution that came later. Um, and for Womack, starting in 2017, um, Zapata was a revolutionary because he was a descendant of African slaves brought to the sugar plantations. So, you know, you can, you can say whatever you want about Zapata, but, but if, if you go back and, and read carefully and you find that, oh my God, he is a liberal, you know, however radical, but he is basically a 19th century liberal, that disappoints a lot of people. So it's been a little bit hard uh, in Mexico to talk about, about the way I view Zapata. Um, and that, that leads me to, to and reminds me, um, you know, uh, Brunk, Samuel Brunk, who I haven't mentioned, I actually think Samuel Brunk's work after Womack is, is the best work on Zapata. I think he really, really manages to capture uh, Zapatismo. Uh, some people say, oh, he has a more negative view. I think he has a more realistic view when you see the documents in the archives. Uh, but anyway, he wrote a wonderful book called The Posthumous Career of Emiliano Zapata. So how did people adopt it culturally, um, academically? Um, how did they adopt the, the figure of Zapata? His, one of his PhD students, um, Luis Vargas Santiago, is a curator and he organized in um, Palacio de Bellas Artes in 2019, the 100th anniversary of the death of Zapata. Um, he put together the most fabulous, fabulous collection of paintings uh, of Zapata. You know, 
from Diego Rivera to Orozco to Siqueiros to Covarrubias, you name it, they've painted Zapata. But one young artist, uh, Fabian Chaires from, from Chiapas, painted a Zapata naked on a white horse with high heels and a pink hat. And that created another revolution in Mexico. I mean, it was incredible. Um, first of all, they sort of hid the painting behind a wall. Uh, then Zapata's friends and relatives arrived in Mexico City and demanded a note to be placed next to it saying, we oppose this. Um, unfortunately, the UNTA, the Unión Nacional de Trabajadores Agrícolas, beat up the LGBT community that was supporting the artist. I mean, it became really nasty. So, um, so yes, every time I'm in Mexico and I talk about Zapata, I, I remember there's a scene in the Mexican Revolution where um, Diaz Sotoigama, uh, a radical who represented Zapata when he was uh, negotiating a government with the Villistas, which is another faction in the North, um, at the Aguascalientes Convention, apparently he scrunched the Mexican flag and he was almost shot then and there. So, so that's the feeling you get when you, when you talk about Zapata. Thank you, Helga. And um, I think that is the end uh, of, uh, of the part where I ask questions. And I would now like to uh, open the floor to the audience to ask questions to Helga, uh, either the audience in the room or the uh, bigger audience on Zoom. So if you do have a question um, for Helga, and actually that reminds me very quickly to turn off the recording.